Okay, so we're finishing our financial literacy unit with talking about stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, okay? These are in relation to businesses, okay? Sharing, selling pieces of their business or borrowing money to help their business, you investing money to earn money off of how well the business does, but also if the business doesn't do so well, that's when you lose money also. So a lot of this you've probably heard of before, but we're gonna just get more into the details of it today. All right, so you might have heard of this term, buy low, sell high, okay? This came from a woman, Hetty Green. Um, she was called the Witch of Wall Street. She turned a million dollars into a hundred million dollars because she knew how the stocks were working and she figured out a way to make more money off of what she had. She technically said, there is no great secret in fortune, in fortune making. All you do is buy cheap and sell dear. Act with thrift and shrewdness and be persistent. So that's the term buy low, sell high comes from this. This is how the, um, the stocks should be worked if you can. Okay. So here we go. When owners of a company want to raise money, generally to expand their business, they may decide to sell part of the company to investors. This is what's called going public. If you've heard of a business going public versus being private, this is what going public means. An investor who purchases a part of the company is said to own stock in the company. Stock is measured in shares. A share of stock in a company is a certificate that indicates partial ownership in the company. The owners of the certificates are called stockholders or shareholders. As owners, the stockholders share in the profits or losses of the corporation. A company may distribute profits to its shareholders in the form of dividends. A dividend is usually expressed as a per share amount. So for example, seven cents per share. Okay. I have a friend whose parents um, put stock in each of the children. Like each time they had a kid, they put so much money into his different stocks, whatever. Um, his parents put money into Coca-Cola for him when he was born. And so he gets like a monthly check from Coca-Cola for earnings or whatever the Coca-Cola had done. I mean, it's a whole like $10, $15. Like it's not a lot, but it's, it's just something. So some parents do this. <clears throat> Coca-Cola seems like a safe company, I would assume, to invest in. Okay. So, a stock pays an annual dividend of $0.84 cents per share. Calculate the dividend paid to a shareholder who has 200 shares of a comp company stock. Okay, so how can I figure out $0.84 cents per share of 200 shares? What math are we going to do here? Just multiply them together. Yes. So, the math today isn't all that crazy. It's more of the concept and knowing what to do. Okay. So if they pay 84 cents per share and a shareholder has 200 shares, then the shareholder is going to receive $168 in dividends. Questions on that one? So can you do the next one? A stock pays an annual dividend of 72 cents per share. Calculate the dividend paid to a shareholder who has 550 shares of the company's stock. All righty. Here we go. Anne, how much money? Are you Anne? Oh. I said Anne. But thank you. But Anne, how much money is it? Wonderful. Sophie, how did she get 396? Yes, 0 0.72 times the 550. Beautiful. All right, questions on how to find your dividends, how to find your company's share of stock, whatever. We good? Because we're going to get more into it. All right, a dividend yield, which is used to compare companies' dividends, is the amount of the dividend divided by the stock price and is expressed as a percent. Determining the dividend yield is similar to calculating the simple interest rate earned on an investment. 
You can think of the dividend as the interest earned, the stock price as the principal, and the yield as the interest rate. So do you remember what formula we used? Our simple interest rate? What was that? I equals what? There you go, PRT. So what we're doing is we are going to use this formula and we are looking for R. So the dividend is our interest, the stock price is our principal, and then the yield is going to be our rate. Um, T is going to be represented as one year for all this. Okay, we're going to keep T equals one for this. All right, let's do one. You ready? Here we go. A stock pays an annual dividend yield of $1.75 per share. The stock is trading at $70. Find the dividend yield. Okay, so we're using our simple interest formula. Remember, the dividend yield is our um, representing our I. The stock price is our P. And we don't know what the rate is. So the dividend yield is given as a percentage, as a rate. Okay? And we said our T is always going to be what? Our T will always be 1. We're representing one time period. All right, so 1.75 equals 70 times R times 1. Let's combine like terms. What's 70 times 1? There you go. Don't all say it at once. Calm down. How do we get R by itself? Divide both sides by 70, and we're going to get 0 0.025. So is it 0.025%? What's our dividend yield going to be? 2.5%. There you go. Yep, we move, oops, sorry. We move this decimal over twice to get back into a percentage. So the dividend yield is 2.5%. This will help you with number three on your homework. Number three is a dividend yield question. Questions on this one before you do the next one? All right, a stock pays an annual dividend yield of 82 cents per share. The stock is trading at $51.25. Find the dividend yield. All right, Blair, what did you use for the I value? For the interest? There you go, 0.82. Good. Garrett, what did you use for your principal, your P value? That's 51.25. Good. Jackson, what do we always use for T? Four. One. Parker, what did you get as the dividend yield? 1.6%. 1.6%. Beautiful. Good. <clears throat> Any questions or concerns about this problem? All right. Ready to move on to market value? Woo woo. Okay, here we go. Moving on. Market value of a share of stock is the price for which a stockholder is willing to sell a share of the stock and a buyer is willing to purchase it. Shares are always sold to the highest bidder. A brokerage firm is a dealer of stocks that acts, on, acts as your commissions for their service. Most trading of stocks happens on a stock exchange. Stock exchanges are businesses whose purpose it is to bring together buyers and sellers of stock. The largest one you've probably heard of is the U.S. Um, New York Stock Exchange. I don't know if you've seen it in movies. They like ring a bell and then people are yelling at each other with pieces of paper or something. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, because there's a certain amount of time where you can sell and buy. So you're waiting for certain things to get at certain prices. It's a big old puzzle. But you're not there doing it. You've put your money into a brokerage firm to do that for you, to do all the trading for you. All 
All right, so suppose you owned 500 shares of stock in JCPenney. Have you heard, heard JCPenney, that clothing store? You purchased the shares at a price of $23.90 per share, and you've sold them at the closing price of $39.69. Do you think this was good or bad that she bought them at $23 and sold them at $39? I hope it's good. So should we make a profit or should we have a loss? We are assuming we're going to have a profit. Let's see how much profit we have. Remember that lady, Witch of Wall Street? She said buy low, sell high. Technically, that's what's happening here. So ignoring dividends for now, what was your profit or loss on the sales of the stock? Bless you. So we did 500. We, so we want to find, find the difference of what we sold it for versus what we bought it for. Okay. So I sold it. The selling price was 500 shares per um, the $39.69 minus the difference of what I bought them for, 500 shares at $23.90. <clears throat> what is 500 times $39.69? What is that, 19845 Can someone tell me 500 times 2390? One more time. 11,950. So I bought them at $11,000. I'm selling them at about $9,000. So we definitely made a profit of $7,895. Not too bad for a day's work. Now remember, you're not the person doing the trading. There's a broker doing this for you, and they have to earn money. They earn money off of what you sell the stocks for. So whether or not you make a profit or make a loss, they will earn money based off of whatever your sale was. Okay? So this broker charges 2.4% of the total sale price. How much money did the broker make? What's the broker's commission? So again, what was my selling price? The 19845. So they brought you in that much money. So they're going to make 2.4% off of that 19,000. So 0 0.024 times the money they brought in for you. How much is this broker going to make off of this one trade? Yep, $476.28. So again, regardless if you make a profit or if you lose money, a broker always earns money based off of what they bring in for you. So obviously they they want to get you more, right? Because the more money they bring in for you, they get more money out of the commission. But regardless, they're making money. My husband's grandma was a broker back in the day. All right, questions about my J.C. Penny example. You're going to do the Pfizer one below. Pfizer, yes, I know. Suppose you owned 300 shares of stock in Pfizer at the 52-week low of $29.43, and you sold the shares at the 52-week high of $38.89. So again, ignoring dividends for right now, what was your profit or loss on the sale? And if your broker charged you 2.1% of your sale price, what did your broker make? Can we predict a profit or a loss? We're going to predict a profit. I agree. All right, so do this one and check with your table, people. All right, check your answers with mine. We didn't make a profit off this trade. We profited $2,838. And your broker made $245.01 off of this trade for you. What? Just by 300? Well, that's how many shares you have. 300 is not money. 300 is shares. So you got to do how much money you made in selling it minus how much money you used to purchase it. Yeah, because you purchased them for 29. 
you sold them for 38. We good? Any other questions? This should, this was all stocks. This should all help you with one through seven on your homework. So, like, people go to jail if they get, like, insider information of stocks. Because if stocks go down and you have lots of money in there, you're about to lose a lot of money, right? There was a famous person. I don't know if you've heard of her. Martha Stewart. Have you heard of her? She went to jail because she knew about something happening in the stocks. So she took her money out before the stocks went down. That is illegal. You can't do that. You're not allowed to know if things are about to go bad and take your money out before they go bad. Okay? You can't have insider information. It's public information. It should all happen all at the same time. She went to jail. Yep. Yep. It's fraud. That's fine, but they, I mean, she went to court and they proved without a doubt that she had insider knowledge. Like, they, that's why she went to jail. There was obviously proof that she did it illegally. No, you can't go to jail because they think you did something. They have to have evidence. There's, there's the thing. <clears throat> so yes, if it's coincidence, then you're, you're fine. There, there's no proof that you had insider knowledge. But if they can prove you knew it was going to happen beforehand, it's in trouble because she knows important people. She's Martha Stewart. Someone was like, yo, Martha, that stock you got, it's about to go down. Take your money out. And she said, okay. And she did it. And that's all that's all that had to happen. Yes. No. Nope. All right. So now we're on the back of our notes. We're going into bonds. When a corporation issues stock, it is a selling part of the company <clears throat> to the stockholders. When it issues a bond, the corporation is borrowing money from the bondholders. A bondholder lends money to a corporation. Corporations, um, the federal government, government agencies, states and cities, they all issue bonds. These entities need money to operate, for example, to fund the federal deficit, repair roads, or build a new factory. So they borrow money from the public issuing bonds. So it's like, hey, I need to borrow money from you public people, but I promise I'll pay it back. And there is interest involved. We're going to see it. So someone in my first period put it nicely. Like the government's like, hey, I need $5, but I promise I'll give you back $6. Kind of like in layman's terms. Okay, so it's borrowing money for businesses. Uh, bonds are usually issued in, in units of $1,000. The price paid for the bond is the face value. And the issuer promises to repay the bondholder on a particular day. This is called the maturity date. At a given rate of interest called a coupon. All right, we got these words down. Top middle box, face value, maturity date, coupon. Okay, so assume that we have a bond with $1,000, has a 5% coupon, and a 10-year maturity date. The bondholder collects interest, collects interest payments of $50 in each of those 10 years. The payments are calculated, again, using the simple interest formula shown below. So the P is what we're borrowing, right? The $1,000 each year at 5% each year. Simple interest rate. We're not building on each other, right? We're getting $50 or the uh, bondholder is going to earn $50 of interest in each of those 10 years. So at the end of the 10 years, the bondholder receives from the issuer um, $1,000 face value of the bond. Because 50 times 10, that's not right. Okay, so let's let's do a real example. Here we go. A bond with a $10,000 face value has a 3% coupon and a five-year maturity date. 
calculate the total of the interest payments paid to the bond holder. All right, so we're trying to find the interest. What formula are we going to use? What is it? I equals PRT. Good. What's our I value? We don't know, do we? Our P value is going to be our principal of 10000 The rate is 3%. We're going to figure out what it is each year. So each year, it's going to earn an interest of $300. So how much total interest will they be paid to the bondholder at the end of the five-year maturity date? 15. 1,500, yep. Question, if I change this one to a five, do I get the same answer? Try it. Ten thousand times point zero three times five. Do we get the same thing? Yes. You do get the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> but if it wanted to know what is it going to be each year, you would say they're earning three hundred dollars each year, right? If it wants to know the total after all the five years, you can change that two to a five and get the total of the fifteen hundred dollars in interest. Okay. So both both ways work. We good? Do you want to write down notes? Okay. <clears throat> Try the next one. The next one has a bond with a $15,000 face value. It has a 3.5% coupon and a four-year maturity date. Calculate the total of the interest payments paid to the bondholder. So you're doing this one. All right, how much interest did we earn in our four years? There you go. Good, Mariana. Yes, $2,100. So you can find each each year is earning $525, or you could have also replaced that one with a four and gone straight to the $2,100. Two ways to do it. Beautiful. All right, ready to go into mutual funds? Whoop, whoop, last little bit. Okay, so the bonds, I believe, covers number eight and nine in your homework. Yes. So 10, 11, 12 are mutual funds. Here we go. So first off, what is a mutual fund? Okay. An investment trust is a company whose assets are stocks and bonds. The purpose of these companies is not to manufacture a product, but to purchase stocks and bonds with the hope that their value will increase. A mutual fund is an example of an investment trust. When investors purchase shares in a mutual fund, they are adding their money to a pool along with many other investors. The investments within a mutual fund are called the fund's portfolio. The investors in a mutual fund share the fund's profits or losses from the investments in the portfolio. So they're kind of all in it together. Okay. There's an advantage of owning shares of a mutual fund is that your money is managed by full-time professionals whose job it is to research and evaluate stocks. You own stocks without having to choose which stocks to buy or when to decide to sell them. Okay, So they pick the companies. They, they do everything for you. You just give them your money and hope they give you back more. Another advantage is that by owning shares in a fund, you have purchased shares of a stock in many different companies. This diversification helps to reduce some of the risks of investing. So instead of, have you heard of the term putting all of your eggs in one basket? So instead of investing on just one company, because that one company, right, fails, is terrible, you lost everything, okay? So if you've got money in different companies, right, then it could... Even out, you could do great, whatever. So it's better to have them in different companies. Um, and the mutual funds, um, they decide which ones to do. Okay, 
So because a mutual fund owns many different stocks, each share of the funds owns each share of the fund owns a fractional interest in each of the companies. Each day, the value of a share in the fund, called the net asset value of the fund, or NAV, depends on the performance of stocks in the fund. It is calculated by a formula, A minus L over N. Your A represents the total amount of assets, L is the total of the liabilities, and N is the number of shares that are outstanding. Okay. So we're talking about big old businesses. So we're going to have big old numbers. Here we go. Our first one. A mutual fund has $600 million worth of stock. It has $5 million worth of bonds and it has $1 million in cash. The fund's total liabilities amount to $2 million. There are $25 million of shares outstanding. You invest $15,000 into this fund, okay? First thing we're going to do is calculate the NAV, the net asset value of the fund, okay? Now, everything is talking about millions, so do I have to put six zeros behind everything? No, we don't have to. It's all in terms of millions. We're good to go. We don't have to. We can just say, so our total assets is everything that they have. They have stock, they have bonds, they have cash. Those are all the assets. So $600 million plus $5 million plus $1 million gives me $606 million worth of assets. So that's stocks, bonds, and the cash all together. My liabilities, they told us we have $2 million. And then we have um, $25 million of outstanding shares. So let's find our NAV. So 606 minus 2 divided by 25. Now, if you go to type this in your calculator, be careful. Your calculator will do order of operations. It will divide before it subtracts, unless you put your numerator in parentheses. Because then they'll do order of operations. They'll do parentheses first, right? It'll subtract and then divide. So be careful. All right, so the value of each share is about $24.16 of this fund. So the NAV, the net asset value of the fund, is $24.16 per share. Part B wants to know how many shares will you purchase. Well, you put in $15,000, right? So if I divide that by the $24.16, we're going to get approximately 620 shares. We always round down with this one. But if you round up, you're showing a share that you don't really have. So we're always going to round down. The 606? So the 600 in stock, the 5 in bonds, and the 1 in cash. All of those together give you your assets. All right, let's do our last problem. Here we go. Questions on this? We're okay? Are we still writing? Y'all tell me what you need. Ready to move on? Sounds great. Okay, here we go. A mutual fund has $750 million worth of stock, $750,000 in cash, and $1.5 million in other assets. Okay, so asset... Asset, asset, all three of those. The fund's total liabilities amount to $1.5 million. There are 20 million shares outstanding. We are going to invest $10,000 into this fund. Okay. So my assets, I got to be careful because $750,000 is not million, right? That is 0.75 million. We're not quite to a million yet, right? We're three quarters of a million. So we're going to do 750 million plus the 0 0.75, which is the same thing as the 750,000, plus my 1.5 million. We have 1.5 million also in uh, liability. 
and there are 20 million sh uh, outstanding shares. So I'm going to stop. You're going to keep going. So figure out the NAV and let me know how many shares are we going to be able to purchase. All right, Kaylee, what did you get for the NAV? Good, 37.54. So each stock is worth about $37.54. So Ula Tunde, how many shares was I able to purchase? For that ten thousand dollars at thirty seven point five three seven five, which you could round at thirty seven point five four if you wanted to, gives me about how many shares? Do ten thousand divided by thirty seven point five four. You're good, yeah. There you go. Yep, about 266 shares for your $10,000. Good. So that should help you with the last three, your 10, 11, 12 on your homework. All right, so stocks are earning. It's what it's uh, you purchasing a piece of a company. Bonds is the company borrowing money. And mutual funds someone's putting your money in a bunch of different companies for you with other people.